Live. Meine Hallo. Frau. <lacht> Should I directly start? Nein, ist noch nicht rübergeschaltet. Warte. Aber du magst Intro, gell? Ja, ja. Okay, warte. Hi, my name is Sebastian Becker. I'm with Stefan Gebhardt. Stefan is responsible for the cloud infrastructure of uh, EM NIFI, a German-based provider for cellular IoT connectivity. He received his PhD from the University of Würzburg on the topic of software-based networking and holds several uh, AWS certifications. At EM NIFI, EM Nifi, he helps, uh, he helps to build and run the software-based mobile core network running um, on, w, on AWS with all its um, enormities and challenges. His company became a 99% only cloud company after the latest project to help uh, or to meet the growing scalability and uh, reliability requirements um, of the interconnections between their AWS-based deployments and multiple carriers, BGP peerings had to move to AWS. His talk is about the challenges and how he solved the integration puzzle of the physical equipment into the existing workflows and tools. Stefan, your, the stage is yours. Thanks for the introduction, Sebastian. Um, I'm happy to talk about the latest project that we did at Amnify. And I didn't submit this talk because I think we have built the absolutely perfect solution. I submitted it because I think that we uh, yeah, worked on a, on a topic that is probably relevant to larger parts of this community. And we approached it with a team of people having a probably different background that most of you have here. Um, if you have solved similar things and, and you think you have built it better or have any uh, input for us, I'd be super happy to receive your message. Uh, so that we can later improve our own setup. Uh, the talk, uh, the title says something about a cloudy mindset. I mean, what do I mean by that? Uh, let me look a bit back. That's myself five years ago during my time at the university, research on software-based networking. And yeah, okay, also SDN runs in the end uh, of some form of hardware. So we were dealing a lot with open flow switches, with servers running open stack uh, deployments. I did CCNA, so I think I, I have a bit of a domain knowledge uh, and experience dealing with, with physical equipment, but I admit I never ran really a router in a production environment. Um, a similar experience, I would say, in the Type 3 open source project where I was part of the server administration team for a couple of years. We ran the open source infrastructure for this project uh, on bare metal servers um, because bare metal servers are cheap and our time was cheap, our spare time. Um, I, I think, um, and, and because we have built everything based on open source software, um, I think we could have delivered things maybe a bit faster if we would have sold our soul to Adlashen or so. Uh, but I think these, um, yeah, this mindset, okay, it should be open source when we're an open source project. I think it's totally fine uh, and shows confidence for, for an open source project. Still, I think um, yeah, we could have delivered things faster to the rest of the company. Um, 2017, I, I then joined Amnify, um, back then a startup offering IoT connectivity for um, uh, cellular IoT connectivity. Um, and as this is offered as a cloud service, uh, all the infrastructure also runs as a cloud service on AWS. What the nice thing is our legacy already runs, at least in AWS. Um, so is this now a better world than, than companies that rely on on-premise infrastructure running their own data center? Uh, certainly not, totally clear that everybody has different conditions or requirements based on customers um, and, and maybe does not want to move into a public cloud. But the one thing that helped this to understand me is actually yeah, trying to focus a bit more on, on generating business value and there, I think really uh, running things on AWS helps us. And by that, I don't necessarily mean that 
we, we run on AWS so that AWS replaces broken hard drive, hard drives. I mean that we run, uh, we rely on managed services as much as possible uh, so that AWS runs database clusters for us and breaks, uh, fix them if they break. We run container services, a somewhat reliable network. I mean, all those things, yeah, we solve it by, by giving them money and save our time. And, and that's for me the important thing that we focus on building the things that, that we can't buy somewhere else because many, many platform services can be already uh, yeah, bought just for some money at AWS. Um, yeah, how does it fit in there that we are suddenly buying hardware and need to integrate this in our otherwise cloud environment? Uh, let me tell you the story about this by giving you a bit of context. Uh, and then I want to talk about how we deploy to these routers and how we are monitoring them as closely as possible to the rest of our infrastructure. Uh, so MD5 offers cellular connectivity for IoT deployments uh, around the world. So our customers get a SIM card from us, by, uh, put it into their device. And we make this thing a lot more developer friendly than, than many of the other operators do by, by offering APIs to uh, influence how the core network and the SIM cards behave. So it's easier to send and receive SMS with this by, by REST and not by uh, the protocols that are actually used by the core networks and so on. But to, to achieve this, we implemented and developed and operate our own virtualized mobile core network. So we are an MPNO, a virtualized a virtual network operator, yeah, running all of that on AWS. Um, how we support global IoT deployments, and, and I, I think most deployments nowadays are targeting a global market. Uh, traditional operators, they route all the traffic home. So when you have a German SIM card, all the traffic goes to Germany. Um, that's not desirable uh, because of latency uh, and, and bandwidth uh, conditions, uh, but also it, it's not desirable that an IoT uh, device vendor engages with tens of operators across the world uh, to solve this. So we uh, run a distributed mobile core network on run mobile, uh, multiple AWS um, regions and by that, by having this split up, uh, we can solve this problem for our customers. And that's uh, actually, yeah, this infrastructure about which uh, I'm talking today. And that's why I want to go a little bit into detail. If you don't learn anything from this talk, then maybe you learn this uh, fun fact, how roaming traffic actually works. So in, in the lower layer, we see here a SIM card that is connected to a cell tower. And when this wants to reach a server in the internet, yeah, actually, we, we need to show those two layers. It's like the telco world, at least in a roaming case. And on top, we see more the, the internet domain. And we, with our AWS deployments, we have uh, peerings with carriers for mobile network traffic and uh, run our packet gateways. And then that traffic is forwarded to the internet or to the VPNs. Yeah, this thing on the lower side, the so-called GRX IPX network, um, that's a private network. I have never heard before I joined Amify about this thing. Um, we receive 11,000 uh, 11, prefixes roughly from, from all the network operators out there. It's a private network. It looks like the internet, it works like the internet with BTP, but it's uh, yeah, just really completely separate for the exchange of roaming traffic. And yeah, we have those three deployments, uh, EU, Asia, and US. And so far we deployed to Europe and deploy them to the other two regions in the next months. Um, and yeah, as we become more and more critical to our customers, when we are down, then their business is usually down. We are upgrading this, so to say, from internet-based VPNs to leased lines and to two carriers instead of a single one, really to make our system a lot more uh, reliable. Um, yeah, these increased demands that we have regarding networking and the influence on, on how the network behaves, this conflicts a bit with AWS being a somewhat general purpose cloud. Um, there is a product by AWS, Direct Connect, where you can basically plug in your fiber into an Amazon router, and, and then you get the traffic usually from your enterprise network or your data center into AWS. But uh, given the uh, conditions that we have, when we are having peerings with, with uh, yeah, other um, carriers, this isn't really usable for us in this case. Um, so we're searching for how can we uh, yeah, implement this in, in a way and move BGP logic outside of it. And the result is that we 
Yeah, just bought good old routers instead of the most fancy software router, Linux-based switches or so, which seem to be able to do all of that at the same time. Um, but we chose here uh, really to, to have a, a really stable system. And we looked for, okay, what vendor can provide us something here that we can reasonably well integrate in our existing workflows and yeah, monitoring setups and so on. And then we ended up with Juniper routers. Uh, a short overview about the setup. So we have this twice per region only. Um, in the end, it will be six routers. So you will probably smile now about our scale here. Um, but that's not uh, the point, I think, today. So we, we have Juniper MX204 routers, two of them per region, so Amsterdam and Frankfurt, as of now, in some co-location rec space, which was a uh, fun adventure to <laughs> deal with that. And then we have cross connects to the two carriers, as well as cross connects to the AWS router where we split up via VLANs. The one is really uh, towards our packet gateways, the, the user traffic, and the other thing here on the bottom, separate management VLAN and a separate AWS account, um, where we run our deployment and monitoring services. And I will be talking about this in the remainder of the talk. Uh, yeah, so the things that we need to solve, basically, to, to have those routers on the left-hand side, together with our existing environment, the configuration is stored on GitHub, Grafana for all our our observability tooling and option to wake us up if things go crazy. We needed to solve these problems of yeah, deploying, deploying configuration, syslog metrics, flow records, and alerting. And I will uh, dig into most of these topics uh, today. Uh, design principles, yeah, basically, in some points, we didn't even know what we really need then in the end. So we tried to build more or less a, a minimum viable project, a product uh, for ourselves where. We, what we could achieve with a reasonable uh, amount of time spent. And we didn't want to get too much out of our comfort zone, like getting familiar with definitely very powerful network management equipment or network uh, monitoring uh, applications that might be totally uh, reasonable for you to use. But for our scale, uh, we, we try to avoid uh, a switch of tools. And we didn't want to set up anything that yeah, that could fill up disks, uh, even if they are virtual or so that, that would then have to be taken care of. Um, so how are we now deploying our configuration to these routers? One of the principles, in my opinion, is that humans shouldn't SSH into anything, um, especially not for changing configurations, but preferably also not for yeah, troubleshooting, at least for the regular troubleshooting cases. Instead, we should build tooling around that also people who are not the absolute domain experts could use. Um, yeah, I'm by far not a fan of Ansible, I must say, but for this uh, use case to push out really configuration to a device, I must say that's where it's really a nice fit uh, using uh, Juniper's uh, modules that they provide themselves. And our configuration deployment looks like this. Basically, um, we, we have a parameterized configuration file and we upload this via Ansible in the override mode, meaning that we erase all the configuration which is there and uh, just use what's in the file so we can avoid any configuration drift. The other interesting thing to which I wasn't used from, from the Cisco world at least, um, a confirmed commit, meaning it applies to configuration and then Ansible continues with uh, executing ping tests. And if Ansible fails to connect, because we have locked us out of the router, for example, or if it can't ping, to uh, certain important uh, destinations, yeah, then this yeah, Ansible run would fail and the router would automatically roll back to the previous conf uh, configuration after three minutes. I think that's a pretty nice uh, safety net. So yeah, th that's all the magic that we have implemented for this. I, I, I'm rather sure many of you have built more sophisticated things, but this was really doable in a rather short time. I have an example of how the Ansible playbook uh, looks like. You can look this up, of course, later then. Um, I also don't want that this is pushed from our local workstation because easily with committing things to Git, this can get out of uh, sync. So people should in, must instead rely on a pipeline. We use yeah, AWS tooling for that. Um, checks out the code. It, it runs Ansible in check mode, uh, meaning that we get a diff then for approval and then it applies this configuration. So now when I say pipeline, I would ask the question, hey, where are your tests? I mean, usually I, I want to see, have automated tests in a pipeline. And in the beginning, it looked pretty 
pretty good. I mean, there is in the AWS marketplace a VMX for the virtual virtual variant of this router. You pay a dollar eighty five per hour to have it running. That would be super nice. This two star rating, this could have been mine, <laughs> honestly. Then looking back. Um, uh, the, the version that they offer is one and a half years behind what we are running in production. It takes around 30 minutes to boot up. It reboots a couple of times, so you never know if this thing is finally ready set up. Um, it's not Juniper's fault that AWS doesn't support VLANs, but I realized this only a little later that, okay, for really yeah, connectivity tests, when we emulate peers, this actually wouldn't be um, achievable with, with a limitation of AWS networking. So now we use it for manual testing, especially when we set up our monitoring infrastructure, then it's a very nice fit to quickly bring up a router with Paraform and then tear it down. I envision there could be uh, a lot more uh, possibilities with Ethan G or GNS3 as a network emulator. There's tomorrow a talk, uh, which means Ethan G, maybe I, I get some additional inspiration there, how we could run even tests for, for link failures or so. If you have something, I'd be super happy to hear from you. Next one, routine operation like runbook. So um, how do we troubleshoot the router? Uh, I have the example of a firmware update. Um, I think Ansible playbook is, is a, a nice implementation versus a, a text document which says, this is the playbook that you should please execute and log in and type these commands. Yeah, Ansible can do this as well. And it can tell us, okay, uh, expect the following output and the actual router's output is this. So we can go through this and verify that the system is really in the state as we expected. I assume even Ansible could compare those two things to just say fine, 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 or, or there's a difference to what we expected. That can be tuned later, I would say. Uh, in the end, uh, we have an interactive playbook where we say, yeah, okay, all looks fine, please proceed. And then for example, it could continue with draining traffic. So it sets a configuration value, it activates uh, one policy that doesn't really as part prepend when traffic is drained based on our dashboards, we could say, okay, yes, please continue. And then for example, install Juno software um, to do a, fair, a firmware update. So this guided description of uh, or this, this codified um, process uh, of this task that we do every couple of months, uh, I think that is um, a nice achievement um, where people don't have to maintain code uh, documentation. Uh, challenges that we faced here, um, can anybody tell me how we can deploy a file onto a router? Uh, we couldn't really find out something from Ansible from the uh, repository to just put a file on the hard disk. It's like, uh, super tough uh, that we use then a file copy command, but uh, the URLs that we used were too long. It's limited to 174 characters somehow. Uh, that was a bit of pain. Uh, the other thing, yeah, we actually don't get a nice feedback when we supply an inverted config, so Ansible fails, but it doesn't say, okay, in this line, you're missing a semicolon or that. That's something where I think it would be worth to, uh, for us to spend a bit of time on it. And in general, but I think it's in the nature of Ansible, the amount of boilerplate code that we need to write, and we execute a command, and then we copy it into a register, and we de display it to the user for confirmation and so on. So yeah, YAML is very verbose. I would summarize it. The second part, that I want to cover is how are we monitoring this infrastructure? The relatively simple exercise is how are we getting this blocks out of the um, On the right hand side, we have Grafana where we want our information. On the left hand side, we have the router. Um, and also in 2020, I think our source log is totally uh, good for getting uh, logs out of the router. Sorry that the animations um, aren't possible today. Um, then it would be a bit clearer. So Asus log uh, put, exposes the um, logs and in Fluent Bit, if you don't know it, similar to like Logstash, a bit more modern, I would call it. Um, this is uh, received and then forwarded to Amazon CloudWatch logs, which, well, probably a service that nobody really likes, but it does its job. We can throw a handful of log lines at it and it stores it and we can later do it in Grafana. We don't have to take care of of a full disk or of expiration of log files and things like that. Yeah, we just needed to run one container in Amazon Fargate for the, the managed container service. And then this was already solved relatively quickly. Uh, yeah, we could move on um, to the next topic, flow records. We want to see what's going on, NetFlow style 
uh, in the network. So we are basically in a yeah, kind of an underlay. We, we have IP in IP and uh, everything is encapsulated in GPP packets. And, and that's why we have around 20,000 parallel flows. And, and based on the simplicity of, of the syslog um, approach, we thought, okay, what if we treat like every flow just as a log line, one JSON document, can't we build it in the same way? And we actually did it. So we, we said, okay, we want to have it in, in Amazon CloudWatch logs because we can also query metrics out of these log files. Uh, and also on the left-hand side, okay, how do we get the things out of the router, um, IP fix, uh, and as a collector, we have PMACCT, um, which in the same time also listens via the BGP monitoring protocol so that it can, in addition to uh, the pure uh, flow information, can enrich it with uh, AS path and a, bit, a few other information coming from the routing process. Uh, PMACCT's standard output is then read by Fluent Bit, and, and yeah, it goes as before, just with a little bit more of um, yeah, configuration really for Fluent Bit because um, what does it help when I see IPs and ports uh, in, in, in some, some uh, flow log system? I mean, that's not very user friendly. So we wanted to enrich it. And as we know, like what protocols are we receiving? It's GDPC or GDPU. Uh, we know which organizations are involved. There's a list of all the ASs in this private network. And so basically we can hard code this in the Fluent Bit configuration, then just pick the right value and add it in addition here to this flow record and then it becomes a lot more usable. Uh, this is in Lua, a couple of Lua functions, which basically just yeah, look some things up uh, and then add the right field to the log entry. Um, dashboards that we can build out of this here in Grafana via the filters, we can nicely filter, okay, give me all the flows that come from operators in Chile. We can basically search in, in this uh, line based on the ASN and uh, name and so on, and then we get our dashboards for this, but we can, of course, also look at the, flow, at the raw uh, flow logs. So GPC traffic, for example, uh, can be filtered out and we can debug, okay, what's uh, going on here. Um, example query, I don't explain it by details, but, but that's how CloudWatch Log Insight looks. Uh, which fields do we have? We filter for the host, so all of this is implementation of the Grafana filters, and then we actually do a blue buy to get the amount of traffic. Challenges here, yeah, mostly regarding CloudWatch usage limits. So in first, when we loaded the Grafana dashboards, they were failing because we had many panels added and you can only submit four uh, queries at the same time. And after we, we asked AWS to increase this limits, which is a relatively usual uh, procedure. And then these dashboards are loading fine. Uh, also Grafana 7.3, which is released in a couple of weeks, uh, will, will implement some queuing that this won't be a problem in the future anymore. Uh, regarding write throughput, I think we could be relatively close to the limits of, of what we can actually write with these 20,000 flows uh, per minute. Um, still, I, one thing is we can split it up into, into multiple log streams. That would be something how we could uh, relax the situation. The other thing is, Honestly, I mean, we, we are looking at Loki, uh, a log system by, the, by Grafana, um, which in, in version two, which was recently received, released, we can also build really metrics out of logs and click try this last week and that looks pretty fine. Yeah, uh, long story short, we would just replace that one storage layer and, and keep the rest of it as it is. Team ACCT, yeah, very, very flexible. The, that comes, what it, it causes some complexity. And I would say the config file format is a little bit creative or so. Uh, so we got some external help to, to make our lives easier here. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, bigger topic about metrics that we want to know how is the hardware doing? How are the interfaces doing? How is our BGP peering doing? Um, how can we get those out into yeah, actually Prometheus, which is the, the system uh, of choice at Amnify. Uh, so if possible, we would like to store this information there. Um, and yeah, one of the reasons actually why we choose Juniper routers is the availability of Juno's telemetry. And this provides a gRPC interface where uh, yeah, an application can subscribe to telemetry data and can receive it via gRPC really uh, in, in some, some second intervals and that's what actually JTI Imon does in open source project by a Juniper employee and what we're using here. Um, we, we list what, what sensors we want to have exposed as Prometheus metrics and then the, the rest was already existing in our environment and we have every 15 seconds 
an updated data uh, with, with really little effort out of this router sure the devil is in the detail to, to find out uh, to get it finally uh, working an example how this looks like for a single router we see okay we have zero alarms uh, bgp peerings are all up cpu memory is fine uh, bgp peerings here below uh, each line one peer how many prefixes received accepted and um, and so on challenges yeah Juno's telemetry um, the availability of sensors is increased with every single release. Uh, also, we are on a very uh, young release. Yeah, there are a couple of things which are not yet covered, so you should better check if this is covered or you can extend it uh, by young templates um, as well. JTI one somehow it requires you that you for every single uh, system that you monitor, you really, really have to supply the complete configuration file uh, with all the sensors you're subscribing to. I'm wondering a bit how this should scale to, to tens or hundreds of devices for us. I mean, that's so far fine. Uh, we also have a patch pending for JTI Mon that a colleague uh, fixed that when the cases when the result isn't a number, but actually it's a string. Uh, that's so far not yet possible for Prometheus. I think it's only possible for InfluxDB. Um, yeah, they were waiting for feedback from the maintainer. And we, we had to set up a PKI, which is definitely not the first thing that you want to do. Um, when you just want to get some metrics out. But after this was solved, yeah, we have um, metrics coming from the router in, in just very the usual way as we have it with our other applications. Um, this, to summarize it, yeah, we had the challenge to integrate some alien <laughs> technology hardware into our otherwise uh, fully AWS-based environments. And we didn't want to, to introduce new processes or new tooling in terms of user facing at which our colleagues have to look at for, for understanding the system state. And uh, luckily, really, uh, that's the nice thing um, for how this uh, also the, the networking uh, systems uh, or community and vendors have evolved. Yeah, we were able to really bridge these gaps with yeah, usually one container, one tiny application that had to be running just to convert basically data from the router into another form um, that we could consume with our usual tooling. Um, yeah, no guarantee that that uh, all of that works. And if you have tens or hundreds of devices, I'm, I'm certain uh, many things will not work at your scale or our scale, uh, tiny scale, a couple of routers. This was really, uh, yeah, nice, nice learning that we can fit it into how we work so far. Uh, yeah, if you want any configuration input, also I have suggestion. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to hear from you. Also, yeah, if you want to play around, uh, if you're bored during this lockdown and want to get a SIM card, go to mufi.com slash devs, just enter your address and we're sending you a SIM card and you can play a bit around with our system. Yeah, that's it from my side. Thanks a lot and I'm happy to discuss with you. Thank you, Stefan, for that nice talk. Um, to your question, there were uh, two remarks already, which module you can use to put files on uh, a router via Ansible. And uh, Patrick Jans out of your company already took that up and discussed that in the chat. Um, there are some uh, further questions about um, what if a company uh, doesn't run in a public cloud, can they still benefit uh, from your experience? I think certainly, I mean, keeping things simple is probably not wrong. Um, sure, if you have your big network management system that covers all the use cases, I think, sure, uh, go ahead and integrate it with it. But I assume many of you have something to, to run containers or, or yes, run smaller applications on it um, where you don't have to spend so much time to for, for maintaining those. Or probably I assume I heard Grafana already a couple of times today. I guess that's not uh, uncommon that uh, we wanted actually in the end all our observability in, in Grafana. And then I think, okay, replace CloudWatch with Loki that you're running in without your Kubernetes. And uh, then I think the rest is basically the same. Yeah, nice. And um, maybe you can elaborate a bit um, how you envision automatic testing of routers uh, of a router configuration changes uh yeah sure i mean that, that's what i had to cut out a bit uh out of this talk due to time constraints um 
on AWS, we would have the challenge that we can't run it in, in a normal VM and even G or so because of nested virtualization. So we would run to ha have to run this on a bare metal host, which would be doable, of course, uh, because we need it only for a couple of hours. But I think then if we load then our, our fixed topology, um, which are emulated peers, I think that that's uh, doable with built-in uh, features of, of even G or GNS3. And then I hope it's really possible via the APIs or, or CLIs or so uh, to interact with this network emulator and, and disable just uh, every single link that we have and ensure that we have still our traffic uh, flowing. Uh, that, that's how I would actually imagine something that we really can execute before we are doing uh, bigger changes. Because that uh, okay. secondary link is down, you usually realize this only when you need it. Okay, yeah, thank you. And one last question before uh, having that done. How you did? The, how did you solve the uh, alerting? Um, that's just regular Prometheus alerting, meaning uh, when we have the matrix in Prometheus, we can in Alert Manager just um, add yeah, rules like we do it for the other applications, um, like if the BGP or if the, the link is down for longer than an hour or so, um, if this rule is, so to say, triggering or firing, then this goes um, via Alert Manager. So, so far, we didn't alert on blocks yet. Okay, um, there's another quick one. Uh, why do, uh, don't you buy a cheap router like an MX80 or a QFX? Uh, the MX204 was cheaper than I expected it for a 100 G plat platform. So I'd be, uh, I'd be interested in, in uh, chatting with you in private. Um, but uh, I looked at the MX4 and MX8 or something like that, yeah. And I think because of the modularity, those were a lot more expensive than um, what we had to pay for the 204, which, which is not extensible via line card, uh, has one routing engine and so on. Uh, but if you drop me a message in person, I'd be interested, of course, in, in understanding like what, what price tag are we talking for the alternatives. Okay, thank you, Stefan. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you, Stefan. He will be around uh, at the meeting, and as he already stated, if he, uh, if you have any other question, please, um, yeah, go ahead, ask him directly, and thank for participating in this call. Bye bye. Bye.